Okay, good morning everyone. Today um, we will be talking about conformal blocks. Yesterday we discussed mainly using radial quantization. Um, we discussed the operator product expansion and um, we showed that in a conformal field theory it exists and uh, moreover it is convergent. Um, it's not like in a regular quantum field theory that doesn't have conformal symmetry where the operator product expansion is an asymptotic expansion and uh, you, uh, you, can, you can use it, you have to use it with care. In, in, in conformal field theory it is a convergent expansion uh, again, you can, you can use it in correlation functions, and what's important is that you can use it in endpoint functions to reduce them to n minus one point functions, and so on. Um, this is the idea that we will implement at the level of the four point function to discuss uh, conformal blocks. And uh, it is a rather strange thing to discuss given that he arrived just in time, he's in the audience. Uh, last night we had dinner, and I asked him if he would want to just do this. He said something I didn't catch, but all I heard was that he has full confidence I will do a good job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, the simplest case, well, we already said that, you know, two and three point functions are determined by conformal symmetry up to some undetermined constants, but the kinematical structure is fully fixed by conformal symmetry. Uh, at the level of two-point functions, there is a unique structure you can write down, no matter what operator you have. It might have spin or might be some uh, strange representation under the rotation, uh, under Lorentz transformations. Uh, at the level of three-point functions, uh, there is a unique structure if you have scalar operators, there is a unique structure if many of the, uh, if say two of the operators are scalars and one is some um, uh, traceless symmetric uh, spin representation. If you have spinning operators everywhere in the three-point function, then there doesn't have to be a unique structure. Nevertheless, all these different structures that might appear uh, are kinematically fixed themselves, the coefficients that appear in them are still undetermined, there may be more than one uh, three-point function coefficient in that case, but nevertheless, the kinematic dependence is fixed. And uh, I mentioned this uh, some time ago, but just to remind you, this is because with three points in space, there is no conformally invariant quantity you can write down, so the conformal covariance properties of the, four, of the two and three-point function fully fix the form that it might take, okay? Now, this is no longer true at the level of the four-point function. We wrote down these quantities U and V. Uh, these are scalars made out of uh, four space-time points that are actually conformally invariant. So starting at the four-point function and then moving on to higher point functions, you have uh, some undetermined dependence on some arbitrary function of this U and V. But as it turns out, this is not really an arbitrary fun function because we can use the OPE inside the four-point function to reduce it to a lower point function uh, to lower point functions, that means that we, uh, th that shows that we might be able to actually determine in some sense that, uh, that uh, function of the quantities U and V. And today we'll see how we do that. Okay, for that, for that take a four point function and we'll do the simplest case. We will consider identical scalar operators. We will denote them by phi in a four point function. Um, and we will choose the points x1, x2, x3, and x4 in such a way that we are able to um, have the points x1 and x2 be close to each other so that we can surround them by some sphere that does not include the points x3 and x4. Points x3 and x4 will be close to each other as well. We'll be able to surround those by a sphere, right? That does not include points x1 and x2. In that sense, we will be applying then, with that arrangement, we will be applying the OPE between the operators at x1, x2, and separately between the operators at x3 and x4, okay? So this will be the logic. And um, what is this going to look like? So let's look at the OPE at point, between uh, the operators at points inserted at points x1 and x2. There will be a sum over a primary 
operators. Um, there will be a sum over prim primary operators that we can write down that will look like, like this. There will be some three-point function coefficient, phi phi o, which will describe uh, sort of, in a sense, the, the, um, the coupling with which the operator O uh, appears in the phi phi OPE. You can call this the OPE coefficient or three-point function coefficient. In quantum field theory, the equivalent thing, you would call it a Wilson coefficient maybe, but it's this, um, it's this um, uh, number. In a conformal field theory, it's a number. And now, there's a sum over primaries, and yesterday, we saw that there is this um, differential operator C, which is associated with this operator O, which is a function of x1, 2, and the derivative at point x2. So this is from this OPE. Now, if I do this OPE, there is a similar thing I'm gonna write down, right? which will involve another lambda phi phi o because these are the same operators, so again, the same object will appear. And here, there's gonna be a new sum over the primed operators o, primary again, so let's call this o prime. And then there is another c o prime, uh, now a function of x3, 4 and d4, Okay? And after we do this, what we have done is basically have substituted this product of operators by the sum over the operators O, pri o primary, this product by the sum over the operators O prime primary, but what we're left with is that two-point function between these operators. Okay? This is inser inserted at point x2, and this is it inserted at point x4. Okay, good. Now this, um, these operators over here, I didn't write the spin indices, but they are not scalars, okay? What I mean here by this notation is this, these are primary operators of any spin that can appear in the OPE of two scalar operators. Now we know that because these are scalar operators, we can move them past each other for free, and then I can relabel the points, right? And this means that I cannot have any, uh, relabeling the points shouldn't make any difference, but on the right-hand side, I cannot have any odd spin operator then appearing because any odd spin operator's index will have to be contracted with an X, and if I have an odd number of Xs, relabeling these operators like this will give me a minus sign, and that will cancel uh, that, that will lead to, um, to a condition on this corresponding OP coefficient, which will say that it's equal to minus itself, and so it's zero, okay? And therefore, these operators over here, both these and these, are operators uh, of even spin, traceless symmetric representations of the Lorentz group. Obviously, in this case, these are the same operators, and because we are doing the OPE in the same in the same, uh, uh, for the same two operators. These are the same operators, but even if they weren't the same, even if you were doing the OPE with different operators here, we argued already that the two-point function of two operators in a conformal field theory is sort of diagonal, right? The operators can only have a two-point function if they are the same operator. And so this will allow you, in pretty much every case, to lose a sum, okay? and get rid of the primes. This is not unique to having identical operators. This is more general, okay? Okay, good. So this is what we have so far. Maybe you want to give a pictorial representation of this, which is, um, this is the operator at point one, the operator at point two, and then there is some sort of diagram you can write down. Like this, that 
provides sort of a pictorial representation of this equation over here. Okay? Now it turns out that, remember, yesterday we showed explicitly how these operators, these differential operators CO, which will eventually act on the form of the two-point function, which is fixed in a conformal field theory. We showed how you can determine the operator CO by looking at the three-point function, right? And using the OPE at the level of the three-point function to reduce it to a two-point function and read off various coefficients that this operator CO will have in front of the derivative terms that they can be expanded into. Um, it turns out that um, around 2004, although serious expansions for these operators existed, it was realized by Hugh that you can actually resum the contributions of these operators, of, these, um, of all the descendants associated with every, because these operators generate the descendants for every given primary. You can, you can resum the contributions of all those descendants, okay? And when you resum these contributions, you get the so-called conformal block decomposition of the four-point function, which takes the following form. In this case, where u and v are those conformally invariant cross ratios, so u is just to write it down again, and and v is this. Okay. Just to give you, uh, we haven't said much about what these objects are. We know that after we fix this overall dependence on x's uh, with the right power delta phi here, as required by scaling and so on, uh, we are left with this object over here. Generally, the sum over all the primers, you can call it some function g of u and v. In, just to give you an example of what this sum over here looks like, in a free theory where you have an operator with dimension delta phi, it can be a generalized free theory, free theory where this delta phi is not fixed to be one half d minus two. This sum over here, this whole sum over here in a free theory is equal to one plus u plus u over v. Where, sorry, one plus u to the delta phi plus u over v to the power delta phi. This is just an example of what this looks like. So in, in maybe I should write it. So in, a generalized, in the generalized free field, this sum over the O primaries, lambda phi phi O squared G delta O L O of U and V is equal to one plus U to the delta phi, sorry, plus U to the, um, yeah, to the delta phi plus U over V to the delta phi just as an example of what this sum might look like. Of course, you can then, once you understand what these blocks are, you can determine, it's a free theory after all, what these three-point function coefficients are, and they have quite complicated expressions in, ter in terms of um, Pockhammer symbols and so on. It's not, it's not a simple expansion. Nevertheless, this sum takes this simple value in the case of a generalized free field. Okay, good. So the crucial point here is that this sum is only a sum over primaries, although in uh, the, and in the in and question. Yeah, I was just going to ask if in in yes, yes, there is, but it's beyond the scope of what we will discuss. But I can we can certainly uh, discuss after. Can you get the G's like the way, can you get the C's like you get the, the conformal blocks? Can, are there, you know, expressions for how you get the C's directly rather than um, the whole thing with the two C's? 
package together. Oh, you mean the, C, the, the Cs of the, the differential yeah, operators? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the objects, the way this was originally done was by setting up a certain recursion relation that allowed you to determine, to solve and determine these Gs. Um, uh, you might be able to solve this recursion relation or not, but uh, the object of, of interest was the Gs, the, the conformal blocks. I don't know that in general there, there exist exact expressions for uh, the, you know, this differential operator CO, but... So, just to, for the record, because he wasn't using the mic, uh, <laughs> he, he said that uh, there are such expressions, they're not very illuminating, they involve double series uh, that, uh, you know, they are explicit in some sense, but nevertheless, not very illuminating. If I paraphrase. Okay. Yeah, right, in, in two dimensions, uh, there are expressions that are uh, simpler for such, for such differential operators, but uh, in general, um, although you may write down expressions, they are not, uh, they are not very useful. It's not like a useful, it's not a simple exercise, for example, to estimate, to, to calculate what these are by using explicit expressions for those Cs, if that was the spirit of your question, I don't know. One other question, if, if you um, continue the internal spins to non-integer values, say, does anything go severely wrong? Well, again, this is, uh, this is a good question. There are, um, there's lots of work recently uh, of, uh, you know, looking at um, uh, sort of analytic continuations in spin in some sense, right? That's what you're asking about. Um, everything we have discussed has to be revised in, in, the, in the OPE itself for such operators one has to be very careful with how they treat it, and that has been done recently in a series of papers by, um, I don't see any of the people around here, but um, this has been discussed, but conformal block decompositions and things like that, for, for that case, uh, although we know that, we know through various arguments that uh, results we get are analytic in spin in that sense, in conformal field theories, um, there, is, there is a lot of work that you need to do to be able to use a conformal block decomposition of a four-point function of operators that have, you know, uh, um, spins that are non-integer. And this is, this is work that is being pursued, but uh, it's, 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 it's a, an object of active research. It's not, uh, it, it is not done yet. Wait, so the internal is okay, right? Sorry. Well, if your operators, yeah. if your operators the results that you will get are, are analytic in spin, but if you start with operators that are, you know, regular spin representations of the Lorentz group, and you look at the OP, what you'll get on the right-hand side are going to be regular integer spin or mixed representations under the Lorentz group. You will not generate anything, uh, non, uh, anything more than that, just by the rules of the group theory of the Lorentz group. Of course, you can then take those operators and treat them in this way, and what you see is that the results you obtain have this analyticity property in them where you're allowed to take this uh, L and treat it as a, you know, continuous variable. Uh, but then if you want to use such operators in the four-point function to begin with, then you have to deal with a lot of, uh, a lot of the formalism it has to be developed. Uh, perhaps you should define what the GFF is. I'm not sure everybody are familiar with it. Yeah, so the... Generalized free field is uh, a theory where it's like the free scalar. So for the, for the free scalar, you might write a Lagrangian like one half d mu phi, d mu phi, something like this. Um, and this, there is generalization of this where you don't insist. So in the free scalar, we insist that the dimension of phi is one half d minus two, just from scaling arguments. But if you don't insist on this equation over here, you can write a generalization of this, uh, of this theory that remains a conformal field theory, uh, and 
it satisfies, it, it has a conformal block decomposition in the four point function of the scalar. There are operators O, just like in the free scalar theory. And the only thing that changes is that you have various powers of delta phi uh, appearing like so. Uh, there is nothing different except, of course, some operators in the theory that you, um, you were interpreting, for example, a spin two operator that's conserved, you were interpreting that as a stress tensor in the free theory. You can no longer do that for the generalized free theory. Free theory. But it's a valid conformal field theory that satisfies all the constraints that we will discuss today, including crossing that we will get to. Okay, good. So I was saying that the important point here is that this, this sum, because of the use of those operators and so on, is only over primary operators, although definitely in here, my notation wasn't good, maybe I should here write that this O is not just a primary, it's all the DOs and all that stuff, all of them appear in the OPE, it's just that we are able to resum the contributions of the descendants for every given primary and have the sum run only over the corresponding primaries. Okay? Good. So, another comment is that here I chose the simplest case where I chose all operators to be scalars and all operators to be identical. I didn't have to do that. I could choose operators to be different. The same logic would go through. I could choose the operators to have spin in the four-point function. The same logic would go through. Nevertheless, computations of conformal blocks and the associated objects, if you have spinning operators and so on, get a lot more complicated than what I will discuss today. Nevertheless, the whole logic goes through. Okay, very good. So now that we discussed this conformal block so much, we want to understand what they might look like, okay, in specific uh, cases. We said they are functions of U and V associated with uh, the spin and the dimension of uh, certain operators. Okay, so in order to understand what they look like, consider an explicit expression which I haven't written yet, but this is for spin L uh, primaries, the two point function for spin L primaries in a conformal field theory takes the following form. So spin L primaries means that these are uh, traceless symmetric representations of the Lorentz group and they have L Lorentz indices, which are symmetrized and made traceless by the representation theory and then we take of course the same operator. I'm just gonna write the indices this way for convenience of writing things. Um, and this takes a unique form again, as we have, as we have argued many times, that is the following. Uh, where this tensor, this is a two index tensor, I take this two index tensor, I multiply them all together, I symmetrize the mu indices, I symmetrize the new indices, but it's, no, it's not just because I symmetrized, it doesn't mean it's traceless, so I have to subtract all the traces associated with contractions between the mu indices and contractions between the, the new indices, okay? This is actually, you know, easy to write, Subtracting all the traces and doing it, it's quite, you know, it's quite a bit of work, algebraically. There is a better representation for this, but I won't write it down. Okay, but I will, I will tell you what this, this tensor is. This I, ten, I mu nu is delta mu nu minus 2 x mu x nu over x squared. So this is a fixed two index tensor uh, that you are able to use to write down uh, any spin L uh, two-point function. Okay, good. So now, I will take this expression over here and put it in this O primary uh, at x2 and x4 correlation function, okay? 
what I mean here, it maybe if you call this point x1 and this x2, here I mean x12, right? x1 minus x2. Okay, so let's do this over here. So if I take this expression and I put it in there, then I can get an expression of the following form for the conformal block, for the associated conformal block So there is this C, it has now explicitly these indices, and it's x1, 2, 2. Um, and there is one over the OP coefficient squared, and this acts on this um, to the two delta, so this is a function of x, two, four as well. Okay, so this is the expression that you will get by just substituting it in. And now we can look at, uh, this is not very illuminating, it doesn't even show that this is only a function of u and v because, you know, things on the right-hand side are explicitly written in terms of the points x1, x2, x3, and x4. It nevertheless is, and let's try to understand it at least in some limit. So maybe I'm we can... I'm sorry to interrupt. Is it possible to adjust the camera because I, we can't see the boards, all the boards now on the, on the screen? Oh, I, oh, I see. It's pretty, it's low. Uh, Thank you very much. No problem, thanks. So let me write this, it's, not, it's quite, quite small here, so let me write it. So this is supposed to act on this product of i's, which I just gave it, gave it one name. I'll just call it delta here. Okay. So, in the, let's take a limit then to try to understand what this object might look like, at least in the limit that we're going to take. And um, the limit is, for this operator C, we'll take the limit where x1 approaches x2 and here x3 approaches x4. So we want to understand the limit of this operator C, how it behaves as x, so it's a function generally of x and d, we want to understand how it behaves when x goes to zero, okay? And it turns out that this is, that this is uh, proportional to x uh, mu one to x mu l uh, over x to the two delta phi uh, minus delta plus l. This is what this operator uh, looks like. Remember, when we had scalars, we had fixed this power over here to be two delta phi minus delta, in this case where we have the same delta one and delta two from some previous lecture. We didn't have this axis at the top. The fact that we added them for scaling means that we have to add a plus L here to make sure that scaling, the action of dilatations remains uh, valid on this, uh, on this expression. Anyway, so now what you have to do is you have to take this in the limit where x1, 2, x1 goes to x2 and x3 goes to x4, you're gonna stick it in here for this, and again for this, and then you don't have to take any derivatives because it's just a leading order contribution that we're interested in. It doesn't have any derivatives in it, so it, but you still have to do all this, um, all these uh, contractions of the indices, and when you do this, you find that g of u and v behaves like minus two to the minus L, U to the delta minus L over two, one minus V to the L. And the limit I was taking corresponds to sending U to zero. Uh, I'm sending X1 to X2 and X3 to X4, so this is like sending U to zero. 
uh, and sending uh, uh, and sending v to one because x one goes to x two and you know x three goes to x four uh, and and this becomes yeah and this becomes one so this is the same as the limit u goes to zero v going to one and at that, in that limit the conformal block associated with an operator of dimension delta and spin l behaves in this way now this is definitely not uh, a full expression for the conformal block, but at least I wanted to show you what, how you might be able to use the expression here for the conformal block to start uh, getting uh, approximations of the conformal block in certain limits. Obviously, you can carry on, you can compute higher and higher contributions starting to involve the derivatives and so on of this operator, right? And start acting with them on the right and start to get better and better, more and more terms in this limit for this, uh, for the conformal block, okay? So this is uh, maybe a strategy that you can use to get a serious expansion of the conformal block around u goes to zero, v goes to one, but certainly it does not look like it's gonna be something simple. You might want to have a better way to get the full expression for the conformal block uh, if you can, and uh, it turns out that originally, as I said before, a certain recursion relation was written down for these actions of these operators. And then this recursion relation had solutions in some dimensions, uh, in particular in dimensions, in even dimensions. It could be solved after a clever change of variables. Um, in even dimensions, it could not be solved. Nevertheless, the recursion relation was valid and it would still allow you to approximate quite efficiently the conformal blocks. Later on, it was recalled from group theory, again by Hugh, that there are operators that act with the same eigenvalue on every state in a multiplet. By, here, by, by, by what I mean by a state in a multiplet, the multiplet is an operator that's a primary along with all its descendants. Those are the representations of the conformal group that we have. And what we are seeking to apply this quantum mechanical, uh, this idea from quantum mechanics, we are seeking the uh, operator that acts with the same eigen, eigenvalue on each state in the multiplet. Now those operators are called Casimirs. And what we then have to do is find the Casimirs of the conformal group. Um, and how do you do that? Well, the way you do this, as always, you do a trick. Uh, the Casimir of the conformal group will be some, combina some combination of the generators of the conformal group. Uh, it's, you know, the generator of Lorentz transformations, dilatations, um, special conformal transformations, and of course the generator of translations. Some combination of those uh, might be a Casimir. But it's not easy to find it in that way, so the way, the, what you do is a trick. So if you want to find the Casimirs, of the conformal group, with the motivation of setting up a certain differential equation that might allow you to so, that might allow you to actually determine the blocks without any approximations. So Casimirs of conformal group uh, are obtained as follows. You realize that in Euclidean signature, in Euclidean, the, we said that the uh, Lorentzian version, uh, the Minkowski version of the conformal group is SOD comma two. But if you go to Euclidean signature, this becomes SOD plus one comma one. So you have this bilinear form, right, that has two minus signs that remains invariant under the group SOD comma two. You change one of the signs by putting an I somewhere and you're gonna make it into SOD plus one comma one. And then you realize that this is isomorphic, of course, this is the same as the Lorentz group in D plus two dimensions, okay? This is the first, the starting point, this observation is the starting fo point for something called the embedding space formalism for CFTs. We will not go into it, but this is the starting point for that. Um, anyway, 
this is the Lorentz group in two plus two, uh, d plus two dimensions, and now you can define, you can take all your generators of the conformal group and put them into a new matrix that is the generator of Lorentz transformations in this d plus two dimensional space. So how do you do this? You write the new matrix M, and we're gonna give it indices A and B. These indices are not gonna run from zero to D. They're gonna run from, uh, they're gonna run, sorry, they're not gonna run from zero to D minus one. They're gonna run from zero to D plus one. Okay? And the way you put the, uh, the generators of the conformal group in them is here you put M nu nu, then here you put one half and then the generator of dilatations is here. Okay, so this is a D plus two times D plus two matrix and you have put in the generators of the conformal group into this matrix, but this is the generator of, special, of, uh, of Lorentz transformations and it satisfies the Lorentz algebra. That's all it satisfies. In particular, MAB, MCD, in this new enlarged uh, space is the same as we wrote before for M, MN. It's exactly the same algebra. So it's here AC, BD, and then there are um, three more terms, right, in there. We, I'm not gonna write them down, we've already written them down before, the same algebra. And of course we know how this acts on operators. We've already worked it out, right? We have a differential representation for operators and they act in the known way, in particular, you know, like x mu d nu. Well, this is not really x mu, this is x a, which is a vector in d plus two dimensions, but the similar idea will go through. Okay. So, well, what is then the, uh, the Casimir? We know Casimirs of the Lorentz group because others have worked it out, so we don't have to, um, to do much work. It's easy to, to see that uh, Casimir of the Lorentz group is just the square of those generators. You don't have anything else. So, you don't have anything else. So the Casimir here is, uh, let's call it C, is equal to one half M A B M A B. And if you were to take that matrix and compute this, you would also see that in terms of the, in terms of the um, generators that you have for the uh, conformal group, it takes this form. Okay. So this is the trick that allowed you to write down the Casimir of the conformal group. And what you know now is that this operator over here will act, as we said, in the multiplet. In other words, will act on the operator and all of its descendants with exactly the same eigenvalue. But the conformal block basically uh, takes in all the contributions of the descendants uh, ca takes care of all the contributions of the descendants, so the Casimir will act on the conformal block itself with a, the, with a unique eigenvalue. Because that's what the conformal block does, right? It takes care of all the descendants for every given primary, for, for every given primary, so the way the Casimir acts on the primary is the same as it acts on all the descendants, meaning with the same eigenvalue. So this, then, allows you to write the following equation that the conformal block, there is, there is um, a corresponding, of course, differential representation of all this, 
because the conformal block is now a function of x through u and v. There is a corresponding differential representation, so representation as we have already discussed, let's call it d. So d on the conformal block is equal to some eigenvalue times the conformal block. Okay? And this eigenvalue over here, you can take any primary operator and act with this C on it. You know how to act on it because we know how to act on an operator. We worked it out already, right? The, we know how the conformal algebra acts on operators using those relations. For example, m nu nu will have this x mu d nu minus x nu d mu and so on, but you don't care about that because you're acting on a primary. You care about the spin, in the spin matrices and you care about uh, the action of dilatations. When you work out what this C is, it's a relatively simple exercise. It's equal to delta times delta uh, minus D um, plus L, L plus D minus two. So this is this eigenvalue of the Casimir that is uh, the eigenvalue when it acts on an operator but is inherited by the block because the block has this operator contribution as well as all its descendants. They all have the same eigenvalue. So uh, this is the action of the Casimir and the conformal block. And this differential operator that came from the Casimir, I didn't tell you what it is, but you can work it out in the variables u and v, it takes the following form. It's not simple. It's one minus u minus v. Um, let me just write it down carefully. So this is what it is in the variables u and v. Okay? Good. Now we have a differential equation. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like we made any progress because this is a ridiculous differential operator uh, to try to solve for. But you know, it's a second order differential, equa uh, differential equation. And there happens to be a change of variables in which it becomes, it doesn't look that much simpler in those variables, but the associated differential equation uh, is simpler to solve, at least in some cases. There is a, an associated change, uh, there is a clever change of variables. Where you write u as z, z bar and v as one minus z, one minus z bar. In those variables, you re-express everything. In those variables, the conformal blocks will be a function of z and z bar, and the differential operator can be rewritten, and um, this differential operator takes a different form, which is the following. And it has some nice features, like except for this one over z minus z bar here, it's sort of factorized. There is a z piece and a z bar piece that are sort of separate. Uh, it allows you to solve this differential equation, at least in some cases. And let me write down two of the solutions. Uh, let me write them down.
In even dimensions, this can be solved. In odd dimensions, it cannot, in terms of elementary functions. And so uh, in 2D, It takes this form where uh, in 2D it will obviously, you know, sort of factorize in this way because in D equal to you lose the, um, the only source of non-factorization in the block in Z and Z bar where this K, uh, people denote it like this, usually K beta of X is X to the beta over 2 and then some 2F1 hypergeometric of beta over 2 beta over to beta function of x. So this is what it is in 2D. It's an elementary, well, elementary in the sense that it exists in the books, function of combinations of the dimension and the spin uh, and uh, a function, of course, of z and z bar. In 4D, it is equal, there's a similar expression that looks like this. So this is, these are explicit solutions for the conformal blocks in this variable z and z bar. You can easily go back and convert them to, um, to um, functions of u and v if you want to. Uh, in this variable z and z bar, they are written in this, in this nice way in terms of uh, 2f1 hypergeometric functions. Okay, so maybe let's, uh, let's take a break and then and then uh, continue with, uh, with uh, what we actually want to get to, which is what crossing symmetry uh, means now at the level of the four-point function and how we use the blocks to then extract information in the conformal bootstrap way. Okay, let's take 10 minutes break. Okay. Okay, let's start again. Can you make it in 40 minutes? Ish. I can try. No commitments. Uh, okay, good. 40. So, okay, let's try. Okay, good. So, um, I, I just wanted to write to, to uh, draw a couple of pictures because I just introduced this change of coordinates and it came. Yes. Yes. So the logic. So there goes your 40 minute uh, cutoff. <laughs> so the logic is the following. Uh, you imagine. So you have your four point function. This is an infinite sum over all these conformal blocks, right? And it has this form that we wrote down, down 1 over x12 squared, x34 squared to the power delta phi, and then there is that infinite sum over the primary ones, right? My handwriting is going to get bad now because I'm under time pressure. So uh, once you have this, then you can project in some sense onto one term of this sum. You can define some operator that acts here on this correlator and projects onto one of these states, so one contribution. One contribution meaning the contribution of a primary, specific primary, along with all of its infinite descendants. Good. So once you have that projector, 
then what you do is you say, well, if I had an operator that did not care about the difference between a primary and a descendant, and what's the difference? It's just some P's, momenta, or momentum gener uh, translation generators acting on, on O's, right, on these primaries. If I had an operator that didn't care, it will act on the whole thing as opposed to each term inside that sum for the primary. And there is such an operator, and this is this conformal Casimir. By definition, it commutes with the P's, because it's a Casimir. And so, it only cares about the primary. It does not care about all the fact, the fact that to get the descendants, you do all the P actions. And this then allows you to set up a differential equation like I did, since this DG is CG for the conformal block, because this C, it, it, you're only able to do it easily because this C is the same both for the primary and for all its descendants. If it wasn't, then uh, it would not work, and you're guaranteed that this operator, being a Casimir, will act in this way, where G will, uh, it will not change the form of G. It will just multiply it with an eigenvalue. Uh, is, that, is that clear? Good. Okay. So I, I discussed a change of variables that allows one to solve the uh, differential equation, at least in two and four dimensions. I said that in, I, 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 in odd dimensions, we do not have explicit expressions of the conformal blocks in terms of elementary functions. Nevertheless, one can set up certain re, uh, relations uh, based on these differential equations that allow you to determine the blocks with basically arbitrarily high uh, precision. There is just no known expressions in terms of elementary functions like in even dimensions. Okay, but this transformation over here, it is a little instructive to go from UV to this ZZ bar. And the way you, you do this is you imagine that this is where this points x1, x2, x3, and x4 live, right? And then you say, I will use the conformal group to motivate a particular change of variables. And how do you use it? You say, well, let me do the following. Let me use special conformal transformations to take a point and send it to infinity. I can do that, right? Because I'm inverting, right? So I can take a point, let's take x4, and I'm gonna send it to infinity, so I'm gonna lose x4. Then what you say is that, well, I can also use translations to take a point and set it to zero, right? And I'm gonna set x1 to zero, so x1 is equal to zero. Good, so two points are gone, x1 and x4. One is mapped to zero with a translation, the other one is mapped to infinity with a special conformal transformation. Now, the next thing you do is you have three points in space. You are going to do rotations to bring one of them and put it here. This is point x3 and uh, on this axis, meaning, what I mean by this axis is that x3 will, have, will be some vector which has some magnitude on this axis, but um, it's zero. This is a d minus two dimensional vector. So x3 will look like this. Remember, we're in Euclidean, so this is, this is what the picture is supposed to be. So I brought x3 on this axis over here, and now, since I put x3 on the axis with rotations, I can still do some rotations that keep that, like I have a vector, I can still rotate around that vector, right, without changing the vector. I cannot rotate to change the vector anymore, but I can rotate around the vector, so I do have some remaining rotations, and that then means that I can bring x2 onto the same plane defined by uh, the others. So you can take all these points, map them into the same plane, and there is only one distance, in some sense, between x1 and x2 that you care about, and this is this z. Okay? So this is just a picture uh, that you can use to understand the mapping between the variables uv and the variables uh, zz bar the associated z-bar variable um, 
is also there, meaning, so, so what I mean by here, by this is I have a plane, so in the plane I need to defi define two numbers, let's say A and B, for the position of X2, so X2 here, you can write it like, um, let's see how I wrote it, A comma B, and then the D minus two dimensional vector remains zero, and then Z can be defined, so this is absolute value of Z, so Z can be defined as A plus IB, and Z bar can be defined as A minus IB, okay, on the plane. So this is how you might think of the variable Z, Z bar, you bring everything to the same plane, and the only thing left after you use and you exhaust all your conformal transformations is this, this variables z and z bar. Okay. Now, these are certainly uh, not... Yes? You can, yes. You can, yes. 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 You can, you can, put, um, you can, put, you can put x3 to 1 if you want, yes. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, good. So these are very useful variables for the evaluation of conformal blocks. They're by no means the only variables one should consider. There are many other uh, arrangements and another very popular one, in particular because of its uh, applications to the numerical conformal bootstrap, is the so -called, are the so-called radial coordinates, where again, you bring the operators onto the same plane but now you don't send anything to infinity. What you do is you have, um, let's see, what do you have? You have x3 at one, you have x4 at minus one, and then you can use the remaining conformal transformations to bring again x1 and x2 into the same uh, plane, so this is x1 and x2, and those are, what did I denote them, rho and minus rho, and it turns out that in these variables, rho, which is r e to the i theta, you again have two undetermined parameters, r and theta, uh, you're on the plane. In this rho variable, uh, uh, rho is equal to z And if you were to invert, z would be 4 rho over 1 plus rho squared. And the same for z bar, which is just r e to the, uh, which is just uh, given by the relation r e to the minus um, i theta. Rho bar will be related to z bar if you want. So why is this useful? Because remember, I initially said that I want to arrange the positions of operators x1, x2, x3, and x4 in a way that I can use the OPE between x1 and x2, and then use the OPE between x3 and x4. And I wanted to be able to do it in, in, in that way. And this shows, this picture over here will tell you that the OPE is convergent uh, whenever rho, the variable rho in absolute value is less than one. And this will then give you a range of convergence for the z's, because those are the z and z bar, because those are related to, to rho. And this is used to then discuss the convergence of the conformal block decomposition of the four point function that we wrote down. And it turns out that the convergence of the conformal block decomposition we wrote down is actually quite fast in the dimension of the operators that you, are, that you need to include. It's an infinite number of operators. It's quite fast, and it's in fact exponential in that dimension of operators, which is good news because it shows that this, this expansion of the four-point function converges very, very fast, and we might be able to use it in, um, in some way to extract meaningful information, at least for operators of low enough dimension. It's also bad news because since it converges so fast, contributions coming from high dimension operators are suppressed exponentially, and therefore we won't be able to say much about them perhaps, but at least for the low lying operators, we might be able to say a lot.
Okay? So these are observations one can make from these, um, from these, uh, from these variables. So now is the time to discuss uh, crossing symmetry. So, but we've done a lot, so let me just summarize quickly what we've done so, so as to, uh, you know, uh, bring back to your memory all the important points. The first important point is after realizing how conformal transformations act, we looked at their action on correlation functions and we realize that two-point functions are completely fixed kinematically. There are some quantities delta that appear in them. Those are not fixed, those are numbers that are free. And in a conformal field theory, they're part of what we call the CFT data. Every operator has an associated delta, dimension, and spin, and that is not fixed by the symmetry. That is going to be determined, and it's gonna be different for every different CFT. Three-point functions also behaved nicely, they also, were largely determined by the symmetry in the same way, and there was a new set of quantities that appeared in those three-point functions, those coefficients, I call them lambda phi phi o today, those three-point function coefficients, those are also numbers that are not determined by the symmetry. They are free and they are unique to the CFT that they belong to, okay? But it's something we want to determine. These quantities, the dimensions and the OPE coefficients are what we call collectively the CFT data and they uniquely determine a conformal field theory. Okay, now another important feature was that operators we wrote down satisfied these unitarity bounds. Uh, we went through this radial quantization picture to motivate, the, uh, to motivate the existence of lower bounds for the dimensions of operators uh, that were required by positivity of certain norms in Hilbert space, in the associated Hilbert space. So those, are the, those were the unitarity bounds uh, and then we also use this picture of this uh, radial quantization Hilbert space to argue that the operator product expansion that exists in conformal field theories is in fact a convergent expansion, okay? Um, and today we saw how we, we are able to use the, two, uh, the OP inside the four-point function to get an expression for this. In, in the beginning we said it was some arbitrary dependence of, the of U, of the four-point function on these quantities u and v that are conformally invariants, but then we realize that actually by using the OP, we can set up an equation that allows us to actually determine those functions. Well, we haven't really determined them. Again, kinematically they are determined, but the parameters that appear in them are again these deltas and these l's and these three-point function coefficients, right? So it's the same stuff that appears in the four-point functions, and in fact, you can show that in any higher point function you, uh, you, you might look at, in field theory, five point function, six point function, and so on, you can successively use the OPE three times, four times, however many times you need to reduce it down to a two point function. And since you just use the OPE, the only things that can come in are the three point function coefficients and the delta O's, the dimensions of all the operators. So knowing the full set of three point function coefficients and the dimensions and spins of the operators allows you to determine any, in principle, any correlation function in a conformal field theory, okay? So these are the essential, uh, the essential um, uh, things that we've gone through in these lectures. So we could have started on Monday here, but hopefully this was useful to at least, uh, going through it in detail, was hopefully useful to at least some of you, okay? I know to many others it's very boring, but at least some of you are, are, uh, are getting something out of it. Okay, so what we now, what we now want, what we now want to, dis to discuss is the procedure which will allow us to extract information about these deltas and these three-point function coefficients from the four-point function decomposition in terms of conformal blocks, okay? So this is what we want to do now, and we have to discuss crossing symmetry. So let's do it again in the context of the same four-point function we've been analyzing, one of an identical scalar. So here in the discussion today, we took the following OPE decomposition, 
we brought the operator at x1 close to the operator at x2, and then x3 close to x4. And we wrote down some expansion. Good. But, um, but I didn't have to do it this way. I could arrange my points in a different way so that I can bring, say, x1 and x4 together, you know, and x2 and x3. Okay, you could do it that way, and you're going to write down expressions similar, similar to the ones I did. Um, it amounts to basically a, a different decomposition. Let me write it on the same. You might take one together with four, say, and two together with three. It's a different decomposition of the same four-point function. Now, it's the same four-point function. It doesn't matter how I decompose it, so it better be that the two decompositions are identical, right? Now, the question is, are these two decompositions identical in a trivial way? Maybe block by block, there is some identity of these complicated conformal blocks that allows you to show that block by block, there's some identity and ch changing points around doesn't really do anything. It might be, and it is, for some of these uh, different ways to pair things up. For some of them, indeed, they can be satisfied block by block due to some identity of these two F1 hypergeometric functions or generally, uh, that you can prove generally of the conformal blocks. Good. But some of them, there are no such identities, okay? And in particular, for this one I wrote down here, there is no such identity, and therefore, there is a non-trivial way the associated condition uh, may be satisfied. And this, is, this observation is the basis for the bootstrap program. Okay, so let's write down the two decompositions. So I already, you already know the first one. So here I will not specify that this is a primary. You know by now that this is a primary. So this is doing the thing uh, that we already did. If you did it the other way, what you would find is that the corresponding decomposition, now you're bringing one and four together, so you're gonna get in the, begin, in the, in the front, the, the factor is gonna be x1 four squared, x2 three squared to the power delta phi. And then sum over, again, the same number, the same um, type of primary operators, the same three-point function coefficient will appear since we're doing the same operators again. And now, you get again conformal block, but now, it's not a function of u comma v, it's a function of v comma u. Because you can show that what I really did here is instead of going one, two, three, four, I exchanged two with four, right? And I'm going one, four, two, three. So I exchange two with four, and you can prove that if you exchange x2 with x4, u and v switch, get exchanged. That's why from the conformal block, of course the conformal block is not a symmetric function of u and v, so it's meaningful that, um, that um, this is of u comma v and this is of v comma u, okay? Good. Okay, so setting these two equal, and if I bring this uh, over to the other side, suppose you set this equal, and then you bring this over, it's gonna come up here in this numerator, right? And then you know, yes? So you had these conditions, right, that uh, so one, two should be close and three, four should be close. Uh, they won't be simultaneously satisfied in both these cases, right? That's right, right? that's right, that's a very good question, yes. They will not be simultaneously satisfied. Nevertheless, they will be satisfied, and this is a convergent expansion. So once I do it, use this trick, I can use it for any arrangement of the points. It's a convergent expansion, right? So as an exp I, I cannot relate in this way specific terms, but the whole sum represents, as a convergent expansion, the four-point function. So I can equate these two expressions. They are convergent. Uh, they have a finite radius of convergent. In order to apply the OPE, I have to, I have to take a configuration of points that allows me to apply the OPE. 
But then once I apply it, and I write down this expression, this is a convergent expression. So it's like expanding a function, like in two different variables, let's say. Well, it's the same function. You can expand it into different variables. The expansion you wrote down must match, right? If it's a convergent expansion. Is there another way to, I don't know. Maybe Alessandro has a. Well, the, there are regions in the Z plane where uh, there are singularities, but as long as you stay away from those, I mean, there is a whole plane where uh, the, two, the two expansion match. I mean, yeah, it's not trivial to prove it, but it has been proved. There are regions of singularities of the conformal blocks. I mean, I didn't go into details of how the conformal blocks behave in these variables rho or zz bar, but you can analyze the structure of conformal blocks and how they uh, behave on the, uh, in terms of these variables. And it's true that certain contributions might blow up if you're not careful where in ZZ bar you go to, but generically, the generic point, let's say, the result of these considerations is that the generic point in the ZZ bar plane uh, is uh, a point where these convergence arguments uh, can be used. And you can equate the two expressions. Yes, yes, you can, you can do a careful analysis of how this function uh, behaves, and you can find uh, the regions of convergence. Uh, I, I did mention some of this result for this row. I just erased it, the row uh, variable. Um, in, you will see that in the numerical conformal booster, for example, we go to points and we analyze the crossing equation in points, around points where we know very well that the expansions converge. Yeah, that's precisely where it does not. There's, there's a branch cut starting X3. You cannot really put X2 on the branch cut. But as, as long as... Yeah. So the, the boundary of the draw before in the row, it's mapped to uh, the, the, the line starting there. I mean, you cannot do all three together, but you can do them in pairs, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, very good, so setting this equal, as I was saying, then you can bring this over to the numerator of this side, and this is x12, x34, x14, x23, you realize that this is actually u over v to the power delta phi. And so the equation you write down when you make them equal comma v minus um, u over v to the power delta phi g of v comma u, this whole sum must equal zero, okay? So this is what people call, what you might call the crossing equation. Okay. Very good, so what can you do with this? Well, the first thing you might try to do is again, perhaps take some limits, okay? Perhaps you can take some limits and maybe to change variables, let's write this at z comma z bar. This is also um, going to be a function and um, well, let's write it like, um, well, let's leave it as u and v because I don't want to write down all the z and z bar dependence, but I will be thinking about these as functions of z and z bar. So here I'm going to have g delta l of z z bar comma one minus z, one minus z bar, but it's here it's one minus z bar, uh, one minus z times one minus z bar. On the other side. Um, Okay, so let's take the following limit. Um, consider the limit, the following limit, uh, where um, we take z to zero and uh, z uh, bar going to z. So z bar and z are identified and z goes to zero. In this limit, 
uh, basically what it means is that this corresponds to sending x2 to x1 uh, with uh, with all um, with all x uh, uh, with all x collinear. That's what it means in terms of those pictures. Okay, so consider this limit. Then in this limit, what you find from this side over here, um, you find that from this term over here. Let's call this contribution one, and this is contribution two. From contribution one, what you find is that the blocks in this limit give you, um, give you a contribution like, that goes like z to the delta of the corresponding operator. Now, they go like z to the delta. That means that since we're taking the z to zero limit, that I need the smallest possible delta, and that will be the leading contribution. In a conformal field theory, there is an operator with the smallest possible delta that's kind of a trivial operator. Nevertheless, it's there. It's the identity operator, and it has delta equal to zero. Okay? So the left-hand side, or, or this uh, contribution here, will be basically, so for delta equals zero, the identity operator will be just one in this limit, right? That's the leading contribution in this limit. For two, uh, we have the blocks of one minus z and one minus z bar, not the blocks of z and z bar because v and u have been exchanged. And those blocks go like log z. These blocks go like log z. And therefore, the contribution two is going to be of the form because of the because of, the, uh, because of this factor over here, is going to be of the form uh, z to the 2 delta phi log z in the limit. So remember, these are, these are in the limit z going to 0, both of them. So what dominates in the limit z going to 0 on the left hand, on this, on this side, is just the identity operator. On the other side, there is a bunch of operators, and they all behave the same way. They go like z to the 2 delta phi log z. OK? Now there is a problem, because how can you get this? If delta phi is positive, because it's supposed to satisfy some unitarity bound, right? If I take the limit of z going to 0 of this thing, the polynomial will always kill the log. And you will get 0. And the only way for a sum of zeros to give you equal, something equal to 1 is for the sum to be infinite, right? So this shows that in a conformal field theory, the crossing equation requires that there be an infinite number of primary operators. And you can do this already in this limit. You don't need to, um, uh, in order to see it, it suffices to consider this limit. It is the only way for the limit in z going to 0 to be potentially satisfied in that equation over there. An infinite number of operators has to cancel the contributions of only one operator. And this is a crucial point about the crossing equation. It does not get satisfied block by block. It's many, many operators that work together in order to make it work uh, from go in going from the regular channel to the cross channel, to the, from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. Okay? So this is, I think, a rather, a rather cru crucial point. You can, you can show, if you, if you look at this argument uh, and, and you are more careful about what you're doing, you can show that these operators have large dimension, the associated operators to, to, to these contributions of the blocks have large dimensions that dominate in this limit in the cross channel. Uh, but anyway, the point remains that um, the point that you should take from this is that the crossing equation is not satisfied block by block. Lots of operators work together to make it happen, uh, to, to, to make it, to make it uh, be satisfied. OK, so this may appear as a little bit of a contradiction, say, with two DCFTs, because this is supposed to be CFT uh, completely general, right? Any, scalar, any CFT that has a scalar operator should satisfy this. But you know two DCFTs that don't, apparently, satisfy this. But 
those statements into the CFTs for a finite number of primaries, they refer to Virazoro primaries, right? They don't refer to global conformal group primaries. All you, we've used here is the global conformal group, not the Virazoro group, not the rest, rather, of the Virazoro group. And you know that every Virasoro primary has an infinite number of global conformal primaries. So it's consistent with two-dimensional CFTs. It's still valid in two-dimensional CFTs, but only if you're talking about primaries under the global conformal group, not the full Virasoro group. Okay? Good. Very good. So this is one very simple application, rather, uh, a very simple application of the crossing equation. There are other applications. There are other limits you might consider uh, where you can send you know, Z, uh, you can take different uh, ways to send the operators to zero or to other specific points. And for example, one interesting limit, um, which, um, which allows you to recover information about operators at large spin, is when you take Z to zero and you keep Z bar fixed, okay? You don't send Z bar to Z. You keep Z bar fixed and you send Z to zero. And this is sort of, uh, the one of the limits that uh, people started to use in the beginning and gave name to this idea of the analytic bootstrap, where instead of uh, doing numerics, as we will do starting tomorrow, what you're doing is analytics. You take the crossing equation, you consider different limits, and because it's satisfied in this highly non-trivial way, you are able to make very general statements about conformal field theories. Where it is so one, if you did the other thing, uh, sending z to zero while keeping z bar fixed, you would get access to the spectrum of, the, of any conformal field theory with a scalar operator, in this case in d larger than two, because you need some universal behavior of the blocks in that limit, that is, happens to be d dependent, but is valid for all d higher than two, is that operators of large spin that appear in the phi phi OPE, again we assume that there is a phi um, scalar operator phi, what you would get in that limit, let me write it down here, So z going to zero with z bar fixed, you would get that in the phi phi OPE, there exist operators whose dimension, they have, you have delta O's, uh, operators O with dimension that is equal to two delta phi plus, um, plus two N plus L plus something uh, with some numerator here over L to some positive power here. You can prove this fully generally. You need an operator, a scalar operator phi in the spectrum. You need the space-time dimension to be larger than two, okay? And then you can prove such a statement, which means that asymptotically, at large spin, any conformal field theory behaves sort of like a free theory where in the free theory, we know that we have operators like this, and then there are these double trace operators that we've discussed a few times. Mu one to mu L, d squared to the N phi. Operators like this in quotes, because you have to make it into a primary and so on. But these double trace, so-called double trace operators exist in free theories, and we find that in any, actually in any conformal field theory at large spin, the spectrum of the theory looks like a free theory for this class of operators. This does not, uh, the, 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 this requires this operator phi to exist in the spectrum, and uh, if, for example, phi is in some gauge theory and it transforms under the gauge group, it doesn't really exist in the spectrum. In that case, you also get log L contributions here, but if phi, the phi operator uh, the phi operator um, exists in the theory as a gauge invariant operator, the statement holds for operators that will appear in the OP of that uh, phi. Okay, good. So this, this, uh, this is, things like this go by the name of analytic bootstrap. Okay. Sorry. Yes. In D equals two, because of the behavior of the blocks, you, you, you are not able to disentangle the contributions in this way, and you are not allowed to, you, you, you cannot make this conclusion. There's nothing happening at large spin where you can see this? No, there, there isn't. There isn't anything like, uh, like this that you can say. Yeah. 
Okay, good. So, since I have to finish, right? More or less, okay. Uh, okay, so let me just say that um, we're going to set up the set up and analyze, well, we've already set up the crossing equation, but we're going to analyze it in this um, numerical way tomorrow. Uh, I, I did want to mention today a little bit of the, a, little, a few aspects of the analytic bootstrap to show you that you can use it in some ways analytically. Uh, but of course, numerics is what brought, uh, in a sense, the revolution in this program, starting in 2008. And this is what we're going to review tomorrow. But uh, I should finish by saying what I said already in some, uh, in some, in some comment, that looking at, looking at higher point functions and applying the same logic, the only thing that you need in order for, in order for uh, them to be determined uniquely is to show that any time you take two operators, O1, O2, and O3, and you imagine you bring the OPE uh, you use the OPE this way, for example, you bring first O1 and O2 together, and then the result is together with O3 and so on. This is what you're going to have to do at higher point functions, right? That this must be equal to a corresponding expression where you bring it, the, where you do it the other way. So this is what sometimes is called uh, OPE associativity, and using crossing symmetry of all four-point functions of the theory, you can show that you get OPE associativity for all higher point functions, okay? And therefore, crossing will work. Uh, four-point function crossing will guarantee that these expansions using the OPE in different channels guarantees, crossing of all four-point functions of the theory guarantees that OPE associativity at higher point functions will produce consistent results. And nevertheless, it's not useless to consider higher point functions. And this is, again, uh, very active research that is currently being done because we don't check. There is not physically, humanly possible to check crossing symmetry of all four point functions in the theory. We have an infinite number of primaries, right? We just showed it. You cannot possibly consider the four point functions of all these primaries and check crossing symmetry. But if you consider a single, say, five-point function, it will include data from four-point functions in a specific encoded way of all those four-point functions of those primaries, of an infinite number of them. It will do it in a very specific way because it's one five-point function. Nevertheless, it might still be useful to consider higher-point functions and analyze them with this, with this, um, uh, use this uh, using the OPE, like we did for the four-point function. So what I want to say by this is because, you know, we are constrained to only be able to do finite num a finite number of things, uh, it is still useful to consider higher point functions, and they do encode useful information uh, for, for the spectrum of conformal field theories. Okay, so let's finish here and uh, uh, continue tomorrow with uh, numerical bootstrap. Any questions? Yes. Um, so numerically, does uh, higher point functions, for example, five point functions, used for in numerical bootstrap? Uh, the it remains to be seen. Let's say it that way. A lot of work is being done at the at the moment and over the last few years uh, to set up equations that one can use numerically or analytically using five-point functions. Because you have to use the, because there you use the OP more times and so on, things are a lot more complicated, but progress has been made in, in, in setting up such equations. Uh, but it remains to be seen how useful they are um, in numerics or uh, in other ways, perhaps. Uh, so you said, you said there's this requirement of the infinite number of primaries. Uh, how, how much does this requirement restrict the kind of theories that you can study? Restri sorry, restrict How, the... Restrict the kind of theories that you can study because, of course, there are things which have a finite number of primaries, right? And there are two DCFTs that have a finite number of primaries, right? But what about higher dimensions? For higher dimensions, 
I think it is widely, well, this argument shows, for example, that, what I, that, I, that I showed that anytime you have a scalar operator in the theory, you can run this argument and show that there is an infinite number of primaries. So, okay. and based on this, I think it is uh, widely believed that CFTs in dimensions higher than two always okay. that satisfy unitarity and all that stuff. There can be strange things that happen in the representation theory of the conformal group if you have non-unitary representations and so on. So, and there are cases where you can find CFTs like free theories with finite numbers of primaries, but they violate unitarity. So you can do things like that, but for CFTs that, uh, where you insist on all the conditions that we have insisted on here, it is, I think, uh, widely believed that those will have an infinite number of primary operators. Thank you. Um, so in uh, 2D CFT, sometimes there is like extended symmetry algebra under which uh, the number of primaries become finite, like yeah. WGW. Yeah. Uh, can such a thing happen in um, higher dimensional CFT where you have an extended symmetry algebra? Not that we know of. I don't think we know of um, any generalizations of these ideas uh, to, to higher than two dimensions. Of course, I should say that Maybe I should say one final comment, that this is not supposed to be, you know, the ultimate condition in some, you know, there are other things that you might consider. You can apply this, for example, in 2D CFTs, but in 2D CFTs, there is also modular invariance, for example. That's a condition. We did not apply it here. We just looked at four-point functions. But you can apply modular invariance as well. It's on top. So this is not supposed to be the ultimate condition. In CFTs also, you can introduce new data by, well, or recycle the data in a way if you consider them at non-zero temperature or if you consider them with, uh, uh, in the presence of boundaries or defects, you know. And what I said pertains largely only to local operators in the theory. But this is not supposed to be the end of the story for CFTs. But it gives us a lot of information and certainly it's part of the, of the tools that we have to analyze CFTs, but it's not supposed to be the, the ultimate uh, constraint in some sense. Yes. Yeah, related to that comment, do you think it's uh, possible for there to be two, two higher dimensional CFTs with identical local operator data, but different line operator, defect operator data? Oh. Well, the boundary conditions can be chosen to be different in those cases, so yes, kind of trivially though. I mean, choosing different boundary conditions will lead to different theories, right? I mean, the extra data when you add defects or boundaries are the specification of the boundary conditions. And those can be done trivially differently for I the same CFT. Maybe that's not... Oh, I guess I'm asking like, uh, well, Maybe this doesn't make sense, actually, never mind. <laughs> For example, if you were at non-zero temperature where there is no such thing, where all the data that you will get at non-zero temperature will be recycling the data that you have already at zero temperature. Yeah, sorry, recycling I Recycling it in some fancy maybe way. Maybe what I really meant to ask is, um, is the local operator data everything that specifies a CFT no, no, in no, higher no, dimensions? No, no, it's not. Okay. <laughs> it's not. That, that was the point I was trying to make. So, yeah. okay. you, make, you, made, ma you made me make it precise. Any other question? Okay, if not, let's have a break. Thanks, Andy. And we start again at 11.20.